This is my first time to visit CERN. I'm very impressed. Um, so today my talk is mainly based on a joint work with uh, my colleague Zhigang Bao, who is also here. And uh, she was heading, who is doing a postdoc at Duke right now. Uh, so we start with a little bit of motivation. Um, in many applied problems, say image processing, uh, usually people can observe a picture that is crafted, crafted by some sort of noise. And um, so the target is to say something meaningful about the end ground truth picture from this observation. And here we will just take this very simple uh, model. This picture is obtained by a true signal um, picture with some attitude noise. So such kind of uh, setting also appears in other areas of math, say PCA matrix completion. So in the talk, we focus on this very simple model. Uh, let me introduce some notations. First, uh, let's denote the signal matrix uh, S. Uh, the, this is the M band matrix. Assume it's a low rank. Its rank is much less than its size. And let uh, di be its um, non-zero singular values, with d1 is the largest one. And the left-right singular vectors are denoted by ui, vi. And for simplicity, all the vectors in this talk will be normalized to have L2 norm equals one. And we call this model the matrix denoting model as QTA equals S, a low rank signal matrix, plus some random noise matrix X. And let this uh, DI QTAs, VI QTA, UI QTAs to be the order the singular values, singular vectors of S QTA. So the question people want to uh, frequently ask is, how does this additive noise x will affect the key parameters of this signal matrix S? Uh, by key parameters here, you can talk about your uh, operator norm, the largest singular value, and um, you can talk about the top few singular values. And more interestingly, we are interested about how this top singular vectors or the singular subspaces spanned by those singular vectors are altered with this additive noise. And in, in matrix perturbation theory, this is a very classical question and has been intensively studied. So there are some classical bounds. They will, he bounds the difference between their um, perturbed uh, singular values the, the distance between di and d and are bounded by the operator norm of this noise matrix. And there is wedding sense theorem considers the uh, perturbation between singular subspaces. So they have the sun theorem. Uh, so this is a more general sun theorem. A simple version of that is sun's angle between uh, the top singular value uh, v1 and v1 q is upper bounded by twice the operator norm of x divided d1 minus d2, the spectral gap. So the angle here we assume is always between zero and pi half. Um, so this classical bound is actually sharp. You can deal with the worst case scenario. And with this additional information that the signal matrix is low rank and x is random, we would expect that these bounds are not optimal most time. So the observation we have here is that uh, when you are dealing with a low rank matrix S, the true dimension is not the size, but instead its rank. So what do we want to achieve here following this observation is that, say if you take X to be a random matrix of size N by N, the entries uh, ID plus minus one uh, random sum uh, variables, then it's already easy exercise in the random matrix theory to show that the operator norm of x the order squared n. So in the classical bound, you have squared n here. And following this observation, we want to show that the true dimension is actually r. So we want to improve the squared n here to be uh, squared r, and which is really much smaller uh, than the size. 
So we hope some uh, great improvement. And this line of work sort of starts from a paper by Van Fu and later on uh, Sean Rook, Wu and myself. We have been trying to improve these collapse of bounds by assuming minimal conditions on the noise matrix X because in application problems, usually the random noise matrix has structures and entries are homogeneous. So recently we have found out that if you can verify two conditions, first is that the action of the random noise matrix on the singular vector space of the signal matrix is small in terms of this quadratic forms are uniformly small. And you can also verify that um, the signal dominates the noise, then we, we are able to improve the classical bounds. So back to the toy uh, example I mentioned earlier. So if you have D1, the signal is strong enough, then indeed we can improve this classical bounds by replacing the squared n factor up to the squared r factor in this case. So uh, a more precise version of this theorem uh, is like this. So if you have the single value decomposition of the signal matrix S written as U D V transpose, um, so U and V are single vector matrices of size M by R and N by R respectively. <coughs> uh, we consider the uh, separation, the perturbation between singular subspaces uh, U J and U J quota that's spanned by the top G singular uh, vectors. So let's denote this angle to be the largest principle between two subspaces. So let me explain a little bit. So if you have two subspaces of the same dimension J, then you can uh, find J principle angles among them uh, recursively. So in step one, you can search for the smallest angle possible can be formed by a pair of vectors chosen from each subspace and assume you get an angle theta one achieved at two vectors u1, v1. And then in step two, you search for the next smallest possible uh, angle can be formed by a pair of vectors from each subspace, subject to the constraint that this should be orthogonal to the u1 or u1 q time you find in the first step. Then recursively can uh, find out uh, g principal angles, and we will use the largest principal angle to measure the distance between their two singular sub subspaces. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I think it applies to the random. Right. No, I understand you apply it to a random matrix, but do you, do, could you write a deterministic statement? Uh, I think, if, yeah, I think if you follow the true steps, it, sh it doesn't matter. It's a random stuff. Yes. Yeah, so this uh, version of the uh, analog of the batting sense theorem says that if you can verify that the upper norm of U transpose XV is, has some upper bound T, and the upper norm X is upper bound by M with hyperbole, and assume there's spectral gap delta J equals the distance between dj and dj minus one is sufficiently large. Then you can bound the sign the largest principal angle between the two singular subspaces by uh, three terms here. So uh, regardless of the two squares j in front, we have m over dj. This is thought related to the signal noise ratio. If your uh, noise too strong, then you don't expect to have anything uh, recovered. And the second term is T over uh, delta J. So this term is uh, sort of what we can predict from the Widings sense theorem. And we have another term, M squared over DJ delta J. And we believe this is a technical term, which should not be uh, there. So, um, so actually in this statement, we didn't say, uh, we didn't ask anything about the uh, random matrix X. We didn't assume the entries to be independent or anything. Uh, and also, we didn't even say this should work for a low rank matrix. However, if S is a low rank, you can take advantage to verify this first condition that the operating norm uh, of uh, R by R matrix 
is has a nice bound by using some concentration inequalities or union bound, you can get some uh, nice T here. So this, uh, this some sort of non-asymptotic uh, estimates for the change of the key parameters. And there are some other previous literatures in this direction uh, for uh, controlling their change in, under this similar setting, a low rank plus random noise setting. So this uh, actually all these results are from their uh, machine learning and statistic communities. So they verified uh, similar results under uh, various con uh, conditions. Um, so another aspect uh, in the uh, random matrix theory would also do some asymptotic analysis about their eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And because random matrix is the main subject in random matrix theory, so we thought to use a different terminology. We usually say it's deformed random matrix and see how their uh, model can be altered co compared to the random matrix um, yeah, you want to study. So here we call them the deformation models. I will mention three very related models. The first is called the low rank deformed Wigner matrix. So it's a Wigner matrix WN. So this is a random Hermitian matrix. The entries in a diagonal, in an upper diagonal entries, assume to be ID, say so it means zero and variance one over N. Then uh, there's a deform by an additive uh, noise matrix Pn. So uh, it's an additive fashion. The second model is called the spat coerce matrix. And this model is proposed by the uh, statistician John Stone. Um, so this can be thought of as the sample coerce matrix of a random vector whose uh, true coerce matrix is in terms of T, which has a structure identity plus a fixed rank matrix. And if you write it out, it can be written as this T half times X X transpose T half. X is a random matrix entries uh, ID with uh, mean zero, say variance one or N something. Uh, it's a narrow case. And so this is a multiplicatively deformed matrix model. And the uh, matrix denoting model we are considering here um, we are considering the singular values, single vectors, so it's equivalent to talk about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of x plus x transpose times x plus s. So it's uh, both additive and multiplicative deformed model. And here we, uh, you're, we, own, we assume that the rank of the deformation matrix always fixed, independent of matrix size. And also here uh, we consider the case when the deformation and the random matrix uh, eigenvalues are the same order. So for all these models, it's known that uh, the extreme eigenvalues and eigenvectors will undergo this uh, phase transition phenomenon, um, depending on the strength of the deformation. Uh, so let me describe this briefly. So this phenomenon was first discovered by Big Mahars and Pichi in their study for their extreme eigenvalues of the SPAD complex Gaussian coherence matrix. And uh, now it's called their BBP phase transition. And similar phase transition phenomena was also noticed for their eigenvectors. And this was first studied by Paul and Bernard Georges and uh, Nada Kutidi. So let me describe the general picture for this fifth transition of the extreme eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So I actually took these two nice pictures uh, from uh, Benak Judges and uh, Red Rose paper. So this paper are generated for their deformed Wigner matrix. So I take that for, for illustration. So let's consider the deformed Wigner matrix. Wn kuta equals Wn with the rank one deformation in terms lambda u u transpose. So there will be a critical value for the uh, eigenvalues. So he, in this case, the critical value is one. Uh, if lambda is bigger than one, this is called the supercritical regime. 
uh, in this case, the largest eigenvalue of W and Q um, will be will jump out the support of the semicircle of the eigenvalues of W and N and become an outlier. Um, and the corresponding eigenvector of this outlier eigenvalue, this U Q theta is a random vector, will lie on the surface of a cone with axis parallel to uh, to the uh, direction of U. And showing this uh, Benak George's paper that this the angle from B U Q times U will converge to a deterministic limit. And there is also uh, a, sup a subcritical regime. When lambda is less than one, then in this case, basically, uh, this bigger matrix will dominate. So uh, actually, the largest eigenvalue of W and Q will stick to the red edge of the uh, support the semicircle law and follow this tracy Vedum distribution and become indistinguishable from the largest eigenvalue of Wn. And then the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue uh, is sort of similar behavior with, with Wn. So it's like a uniform vector on the unisphere, and it has no bears to any particular direction. So in particular, it's asymptotically perpendicular to uh, U. Um, so, uh, for the supercritical case, um, Nolus and the uh fully studies the fluctuation of this outlier eigenvalue. And our result here is we are going to study the fluctuation between the angles formed by UQ and U um, in the supercritical regime for the matrix denoising uh, model. And there are, some, there are a lot of previous uh, literatures in starting the extreme eigenvalues. So I collect all of them together. It may not be very complete for their uh, extreme eigenvalues. And also, I did not distinguish all the three uh, kinds of deformation models. And there are much less literatures on the study of extreme eigenvalues, especially for their fluctuation of the angles um, between their extreme eigenvectors. So before our paper, it's not a fully started for the matrix denoising model. And there are, some, there are two papers, a paper by Nola Sin and a paper by Captain Mar uh, Donald Martin, which is very related to our results. I will uh, talk about their details later. So let me uh, show you what we have done here. So we are uh, talking about this matrix denoising model at it's Q theta equals S plus X. So SVD of S is given in terms of DI, UI, VI, trans, VI. And that by uh, the singular value decomposition, S Q theta is written in terms of DI Q theta, UI Q theta, VI Q theta. So under these assumptions, first, the aspect ratio M over N converges to a non-zero finite number Y as N goes to infinity. And further, uh, Random noise matrix X, we assume that the entries of spurred NX are ID random variables, which means zero, one, one, one and has some uh, bounded high moments. The scaling squared N put in with this X is to make sure the singular values of S are of constant order. And we also impose this supercritical condition, um, which basically says that. First, we consider all the uh, eigen, uh, singular values of the signal matrix are bigger than their critical value, uh, y to the quarter in this case. So we will create outlier uh, singular values after perturbation. And also assume these uh, singular values are well separated, uh, such that after perturbation, the singular values of S Q are also well separated so when I talk about the individual singular vectors corresponding to the perturbed singular values, we don't have ambiguity um, to define them. So uh, we'll give the uh, result about the fluctuation of this quantity vi dot vi, um, 
theta square. So it only gives the result for the uh, right singular vectors. For the left, it's just apply the result for the transpose of those matrices. So the result looks like this. Uh, we define uh, two, some <coughs> auxiliary functions, A of D, D here are the singular values, and C of D. So uh, VI dot VI Q dot square um, subtract its first order limit written in terms A D I and scale by squared N, uh, this random variable will asymptotically uh, distribute it as delta I plus Z I. Here are the two random variables, delta I and Z I are independent and delta I is explicit. It's written as minus two squared N C tab D I given in this uh, rational function, and times this quadratic form, ui transpose x vi. And zi has a normal distribution with uh, mean mi and variance vi. And this mean and variance are explicit. It depends on the singular vectors, ui to vi, and also depends on the cumulant, kappa three, kappa four, of the uh, normalized entry of the noise matrix. So actually, we can write down this mean and the variance uh, of ZI explicitly, but it takes a whole slides to, to do that. But also, we need to introduce some shorthand notations to simplify the expression. However, after those simplifications, still, uh, the mean look like this, and the variance uh, will look like this. So a bunch of complicated expressions. So anyway, what our result basically says that the fluctuation of the quantity we, we uh, studies depends on both on the structure of the signal and also on the distribution of the noise matrix. So it's a non-universality result. Um, so let's see some special cases to see what we have actually done here. Um, just assume this rank one case the perturbation, uh, this signal matrix S equals D U V transpose. And what we show is this limited distribution is delta plus Z. Uh, when the entries of the noise matrix are ID Gaussian, and because the rotation invariance property, we don't expect the result should depend on the structure of U of V. So this is indeed the case. The limiting distribution would be a normal random variable with mean zero and some variance depend only on the uh, singular value D. And if both U and V are delocalized in the sense that their infinity norm converted to zero as um, n goes to infinity, then in the limit, we will still have a normal uh, distribution. So with a possible zero, non-zero mean uh, written depending on their uh, singular vectors are also depend on uh, kappa three. And if only one of the left or right singular vectors is localized, say the left singular vector is localized in this sense, then we still see the normal distribution in the limit um, with some mean and variance. And however, if U and V uh, have specky entries we don't usually see a normal distribution in the limit. For instance, if you assume all the weights of U and V are in their first coordinate, and zero elsewhere, in the limit, we will see uh, minus two theta D squared NX11 plus an independent normal random variable. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are two very related results. Uh, they are both for the supercritical regime for the deformed Wigner matrix. The first one is the uh, paper by uh, Nolus and Yin. They also they started the limited distribution of the outlier eigenvalues of deformed Wigner matrix. Uh, this is solved in full generality. Uh, the fluctuation of that also depends on structure deformation and the uh, distribution of the random noise part. So our results can be viewed as an analog for the outlier singular vectors um, of zero result. Uh, Captain 
And Donald Martin, he considered a similar question about the fluctuation of the outlier eigenvectors. Uh, however, they assume some additional if, uh, assumption this deformation matrix Pn has to be diagonal. And there are some actual conditions on the entries of the Wigner matrix. So if the entries, if Pn is a diagonal matrix, you can take its eigenvectors to be their canonical basis. So their result is actually in a similar format as we see in this case. So it's be non-universality. And also we did something about the uh, singular subspace statistics. So the quantity we consider here is that uh, we want to measure the separation between their singular subspace spanned by the top R singular vectors. So we sort of project orthogonal basis of VR cuta uh, onto all the directions of VI, square them and sum them up. And this measures how separate V and VR cuta uh, is. So, and we put some analogous result for this statistics. So result is uh, sort of similar. So um, I want to say something about the uh, proof ideas. So um, actually, uh, I want to mention that the idea in Nolis and Yin's approach, this is actually based on a two-step comparison method. So we consider the defined vacant matrix, WQ equals W plus P. What it did is that it first derived the result when W is a Gaussian. Uh, entries are Gaussian, and then reconstruct the partially Gaussian matrix W Q uh, W hat, depending on the structure of the deformation matrix. So it's, uh, the entries of W hat are almost Gaussian, and then uh, the y result for W hat. Then from W hat you can uh, divide the result to the general regular matrix. So. Uh, actually, we are going to take a different and more direct approach. So let me uh, introduce the uh, main ideas in the proof. Uh, so we still consider the rank one deformation case. Um, so some preparation for, for later um, usage is that it's known that the empirical spectral distribution of this X times x transpose and x transpose times x converges to this well-known uh, Machenko pasture distributions denoted by uh, M F M P one F M P two, and with these two uh, distributions, you can consider the student transforms uh, M one of z defined for z in the upper half plane. So, and you get two complex functions M one and M two. Yeah, deterministic. So we don't work with SQTA directly. We will first use this linearization trick. We are going to work with a, a bigger matrix of size, uh, m plus n times m plus n, by putting their uh, signal and noise in the off-diagonal blocks in this way. So noise part become, uh, put x here, and x transpose, you see, uh, this, this block. And similarly, do the same thing for this signal matrix. So for this uh, augmented matrix, they're uh, symmetric, so, and also their eigenvalues and eigenvectors uniquely determine the singular value single vectors of our original matrix. And it's more pleasant to work with symmetric matrix. And we'll define the uh, green function of the noise part. So the noise, noise matrix now become uh, this HZ, so the green function of that, we call it G of Z, is H minus Z times identity inverse. Yeah. And a very important ingredient in our proof is that this green function can be uh, well approximated by a determinist matrix, pi of Z, uh, which is a diagonal matrix with the first diagonal entries M1 remaining diagonal entries M2. So M1, M2, that still transforms 
of the Marchenko pastoral law. So the initial step uh, to use green function to study the uh, spectrum of the matrix with here is to find a green function representation of the quantity we are interested in, v dot v q dot square. So you can look at the green function of this product matrix y, y minus t z minus one at, uh, inverse. The pool of this uh, green function are the uh, eigenvalues of y. So under our assumption, the largest eigenvalue uh, y are well separated for the remaining. So you can, it's possible to take a closed curve with only, uh, such that this green function has only one pool inside, and then you do the counter integral um, of this quadratic form on this curve, and then a very simple residue theorem will, tear, will help you to extract out uh, this quantity, you can use this spectral decomposition of y minus z inverse and write it down. You see that. Okay. And um, from this identity, um, and with a little bit linear algebra trick, we are able to, um, you can put this perturbation in here and extract out h minus z inverse, the green function of the noise matrix then you are able to express the quantity in terms of integral uh, of the green function uh, of this noise matrix. And from this step, then you do some resolvent expansion to expand out the green function of H. And then we use the approximation of G uh, with a deterministic matrix pi by replacing G with pi then you are able to extract the first order term, A of D, and also the lower order terms. In this case, we'll consider the terms of order when we score N are captured by the sum of trees G minus pi times A plus the trees of G prime minus pi prime times B. And here, A and B are some explicit um, fixed rank and bounded matrix. So once we are done with this step, um, the problem is reduced to study the law of this function in terms of green function. So uh, the green functions uh, have very rich algebraic structures, um, more pleasant workways. So that's called Q is the square and the trees plus the trees. What we do is that we are going to construct a random variable delta that is composed of uh, C1, C2. Um, the first part is a random part. So uh, this is basically a linear combination of the uh, random, matrix, uh, random matrix XIJs with respect to the specky entries in the singular vectors. And this part will prevent uh, delta to become normal. Um, and the second part is the determinist part, uh, basically used to centralize Q. So what we actually want to do now is to show that delta minus, uh, Q minus delta, this is asymptotic Gaussian, and this will be the normal random variable we see in the conclusion. And we also want to show that delta minus uh, Q and Q minus delta and delta is uh, asymptotically independent. So uh, to do that, we'll, uh, our strategy is to establish this uh, recursive estimates. So uh, we show that uh, extended value of Q minus delta to the power K, e to the i t delta equals K minus one, some variance, some number V, extended value of Q minus delta to the lower power K minus two e to the at the delta with some negligible errors. So once you have this recursive estimates, the two goals are achieved simultaneously. So you can see if you take t equals zero, you get this uh, Q minus delta, have this Gaussian recursive um, estimate, so it's asymptotic Gaussian. 
And for the independence between Q minus theta and delta, you can, it's a very uh, easy exercise to derive uh, this sort of um, expand the value of the product of e to the uh, as q minus delta plus i t delta is the product expected value of e to the is q minus delta and expected value of e to the i t delta. So this can be derived <coughs> from the recursive estimate. So this shows the independence between q minus delta and delta. Um, so there are two very important ingredients in our proof. The first is called the uh, cumulant expansion formula. So uh, this is a very useful formula, um, which states that if you have a CL plus one function and with a centered random variable C, um, the expanded value C times FKC can be uh, expanded in terms of cumulant of C. So you can imagine there uh, case when Kasi has a standard normal run uh, distribution, then um, the first cumulant is zero, second cumulant is one, all the other cumulants become zero. So you see expanded value, Kasi F Kasi is expanded value F prime Kasi. This is a, a famous Stenz lemma. And for general random variables, you have such cumulant expansion. And this uh, cumulant expansion idea has been recently used by uh, first uh, by Lee Schnelli and Hu and Nola's paper. And another um, important ingredient is that our uh, proof actually based on the establishment of the, this uh, isotropic local law. So it provides very nice, precise, uh, large division bounds of this quadratic forms of u uh, dot g prime minus pi prime plus v. u and v here are arbitrary uh, determinist unit vectors. So this result is proved in a uh, paper by Blumenthal, L. Dishnolis, Yang Yin, also can be found uh, in Nolis Yin's uh, data paper. So this will help us to extract useful information and efficiently control those error terms. Um, so that's all about the uh, proof stuff. So I want to also mention that uh, recently, we also following a similar idea, we actually uh, proved some results in this uh, spec corners matrix model. So here, uh, the assumptions are quite similar, uh, it's just, for the signal, uh, now the T matrix, we relax the supercritical condition to this so-called non-overlapping condition. So we assume this uh, DI in the eigenvalue decomposition of T, this is bigger than critical value Y to the half with some independent term and to the minus one third and also di are sort of separate from other uh, eigenvalues uh, bigger than this term. So these two terms are the optimal we can expect from the uh, fluctuation of the uh, extreme eigen eigenvalues. So under these assumptions, we sort of devise a uh, joint limited distribution of the outlier uh, eigenvalue di hat, and also uh, we consider this generalized component uh, ui hat dot w square. Here, w is an arbitrary uh, unit vectors, so it can be ui, which is a previous result uh, we divided for the matrix dot model. It can be also be any direction, either uh, perpendicular to UI or not. So we also consider cases when, when DI can have multiplicity more than one. So uh, we're still polishing uh, this paper. But uh, basically that's all I would like to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, I have a question. On the first part of your talk, uh, you resolved. Uh, do you have a, also a general result, which is true when you have a, a vector eigenspaces which are of dimension more than one? When you have multiple uh, eigenvalue? You this mean one. this nice and yes. part? Because there the, spec the outlier spectrum is simple, if I understood correctly. Can you mm. have something? Do you have some result when you? Oh, when you have, you mean there are uh, multiple eigenvalues? Well, something like this. Yes. You mean for the individual single vector. Yeah, this also applies to that case, but you need to have some, say, uh, if you want to control the angle between uj and uj cuta, the singular vectors, you need dj to be separated from all the other two. We have a version of that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, actually, if, uh, a singular subspace is more stable than the individual uh, singular vectors. Yeah. Okay, thank you.